Let's hop in the back seat. Are you trying to get frisky with me? Only if you want me to. Ooh. I'm really trying to get frisky with your son, remember? Oh, that's right. Forgot all about that. Silly straight woman. What you just witnessed was the absolute chaos of the early 2000s reality TV show program. And when I say, oh, reality TV shows were awkward and scripted, I don't mean that they might make you laugh uncomfortably from time to time. I mean that they were, without a doubt, the pure definition of cringe. Josh has got a lovely whip. Makes a really awesome sound. He just likes to slip it in the air. Makes a cool noise. Be a good b No. What the hell? Yes, this really did air on MTV. I know it might look like something you'd find in an alternate dimension because it's almost too ridiculous to be real, but this is something that actually happened. In Date My Mom, a single guy would go on dates with three different mothers, all of whom tried to convince this guy that their son or daughter was the right match for them. Yet as scripted and strange as it was, was the show actually harmful at all? Well, apart from the way the main bachelor Jeremy downright insulted the second contestant's looks, that is. You suck. Meet my bootylicious son, Nick. Looks like the no sex is not a choice. This was just the way that television was in the early 2000s. A wild west of reality programs constantly trying to one-up each other on how ridiculous they could be. According to Esquire, there really was a show for everyone back then, from falling in love to singing competitions to gaslighting America into believing you're richer than you are and then leveraging your fame to become the president and attempting to ruin democracy only to get indicted on 34 felony charges. Hmm, too soon on that last one? Anyway, the point remains the same. Reality TV shows were a powerful tool. And I don't just mean in terms of money and ratings, but as fake and as ironic as it was, it did have the power to shape reality all the same. American Idol, for example, has given us some incredible artists and icons like Carrie Underwood, Kelly Clarkson, and Jennifer Hudson. Plus, when these programs did air unscripted content, they might end up showing some important conversations around feminism, queerness, and race that other shows shied away from. So maybe reality TV isn't always so bad and it won't totally rot your brain, right? Well, we probably shouldn't go that far. There are upsides to reality TV, but there are inevitably downsides too. As cringy and silly as it might seem, there were undeniably some dangerous moments sprinkled in. And no, I don't just mean when people were made to eat bugs or other grotesque things on Fear Factor. But when these conversations around race or sexuality were sensationalized for views, now, I'm sure none of you were surprised to hear that reality TV could get exploitative, but it may be even more exploitative than you think, from a black and white family swapping races to a show devoted to finding absentee fathers and giving them a prize to straight men posing as gay to win money. Yeah, we're gonna go take a look at all of that on today's episode of The Corporate Casket. If I tried to talk about every single reality TV program with issues, we would be here for probably at least hours, if not days or weeks. I've already rated some of the ones that I remember on a live stream I did like a year ago or something on the Illuminati channel, but this is a bit of a deeper dive into the more like the overview of old school reality TV shows as like the industry itself, not particular episodes, if that makes sense. Today, I'm breaking these chapters up into a sort of genre of TV. So we're gonna go ahead and start with the early 2000s of dating programs because that was an absolute like overwhelming amount of these programs. I'm sure many of you are familiar with The Bachelor and the other popular long lasting shows like it, but what about the show Joe Millionaire? This was effectively a Bachelor parody, but with a twist. The single man in question lied about his wealth, the women on the program competing for his attention were told he was worth up to $50 million when Evan Marriott actually made only $19,000 a year working in construction. The hook of the show overall is the lie, the absolutely enormous lie. They really did a fun job of selling the fantasy. I loved the butler. The show was misleading and that's all there is to it. 
Evan, the star, apologized years later, saying that he'd been wildly offensive in 2003 and that he didn't understand the repercussions of how popular the show was going to be. He added, quote, "'When it came time to handle the minimal celebrity that I had, I failed miserably.'" And honestly, good on Evan for reflecting on his own behavior here, and I think he has a good point. When average Joes, literally as the show was Joe Millionaire, are tossed on television, it can be hard to realize that these programs are viewed by potentially millions of people. And at the same time, isn't that up to producers to recognize this too? Shouldn't they be the ones taking a step back and thinking, hey, maybe getting all giddy about how these women will react to being lied to isn't the right play here? We as the audience were really supposed to be more aligned with Evan than we were with these women because these women were being framed as gold diggers. Nope. Instead, the show rebooted, this time called Joe Millionaire for Richer or Poorer. And now there were two Joes that women could compete for. One was rich and one was poor, but the women had no idea which is which. However, as tacky as this type of programming might be, is it actually offensive and dangerous? I'm not super sure about that. After all, tacky and misleading don't automatically equal stigmatizing and problematic. So let's kick things up a notch. Boy Meets Boy is, as Time Magazine calls it, a nasty piece of work. In this program, The Bachelor was a gay man trying to find his ideal partner in a group of gay and straight men. What neither the gay suitors nor the leading man know is that some of the suitors are straight men pretending to be gay. I love you. Competing to win a cash prize. And there are so many things wrong with this depiction of gay romance that I honestly don't even know where to start. First of all, while I do agree that the twist is downright cruel in this case, it's pretty messed up in the first one, Joe Millionaire, because of the lie, but the winner does receive a massive cash prize either way. So whether wealth or love was the goal, the contestant will ultimately get what they want. But in this case, Bachelor James had no idea who was straight and who wasn't, meaning that if he fell in love with a straight man, too bad, there's literally no chance of that working out. It's a waste of his time, and if I'd been him, I'd feel pretty damn used. Secondly, from the first episode, it also feels like these men are using gay stereotypes to fit in. And I confess I did not watch the entire program, but I did skim through a few episodes. And in my opinion, it feels like the men pretending to be gay use stereotypes to do so. Things like acting overly sexual, speaking in a more like traditionally feminine manner, and even telling their own coming out stories. It just feels extremely gross and wrong to see straight men playing these caricatures of what they think gay men are. And look, I could be wrong. Maybe the editors made it look way worse than what it appears, but that's definitely how it came across. This show was by no means the only one perpetuating damaging stereotypes. The Washington Post released an article all about the old school reality romance programs, revealing some of their most disturbing features. For example, the producer of Who Wants to Marry a Millionaire, Mike Darnell, he openly admitted that he wanted to replicate the program Who Wants to Be a Millionaire by honing in on Americans' anxieties around love and money. Getting married and having money are two continually sought after needs. So here he was combining both of them to make bank. But critics, quote, likened the spectacle to prostitution, end quote. And their fury was justified as years later, it was revealed that the wealthy leading man had a restraining order filed against him by an ex who alleged he abused her. His bride later told media outlets she, quote, cried herself to sleep every night after she won and the marriage was annulled. But this isn't the only time that background checks have failed contestants on romance reality show programs. Over the years, it's been revealed that various men on The Bachelorette had done some pretty heinous things, from speaking misinformation about the Parkland shooting to having charges for indecent assault and battery brought against them. Apparently, the very first Black Bachelorette was even paired with a contestant who once equated the NAACP with the KKK. A similar situation happened on the first Black Bachelor too. But sure, these programs are about finding love, so who cares about racism when you can horseback ride with the woman or man of your dreams? And to further that, why does it matter if a contestant drugged, raped, or assaulted someone when they've just got such a nice jawline? This is all sarcasm, by the way, please. It is sarcasm. I am obviously kidding, and the creators and producers of these programs need to do better. I'm guessing Date My Mom now looks pretty harmless by comparison, right? Well, unfortunately, there are still plenty of other reality programs from this time frame that had many controversies, and dating programs weren't always the worst of them. You've heard of Wife Swap, right? Well, what about Race Swap? 
That's effectively what the program Black White was all about. In it, a white family and a black family pretended to be each other's races to basically spend a day in the other's shoes. And while I'm all for educating, this social experiment type program is so bananas insulting that I don't really know if I have other words for it. Jarvis Johnson and Jordan Attica had reacted to this program and the clips for the show that they showcase are unreal. And that's absolutely a word for it. For one, the blackface, and yes, the white family does use blackface, is it's terrible, it's unrealistic, and it's insulting. For two, the father of the white family, Bruno, uses the N-word like a ridiculous amount of times. It's like he's trying to create a drinking game with it, and it just seems like he was a little too excited to say the word, you know what I mean? I'm kind of waiting for somebody to go, hey, <laughs> no! <laughs> Hell yeah. He even told a focus group full of black people while in blackface that he had been called the N-word back in the day when he was a doorman at a club. He even explains to the room that they all just shouldn't give the word any power over them, which is, you know, pretty damn easy for him to say as a white man. Like that. Yeah, I used to work as a doorman at a disco, you know, and if somebody came up intoxicated or didn't have the right dress on, you know, they say, come on. Now. And for three, the way the white parents seem to fetishize their race swapping is, I don't know, maybe it's just me. I find it just deeply uncomfortable and gross. I, I am not sure why, but I feel very just Icky. Oh my God, Bruno. It's nice, yeah, I, I love black. Honestly, I think the New York Times hit the nail on the head when they said that the show is most impressive as a feat of cosmetology and that's about it. Otherwise it's shallow and poorly done and you're left believing that the worst injustice a black person can face is being denied the chance to buy high-end jeans when they don't discuss more meaningful situations. Here's a quote. Black white would have felt more substantive had it sent Brian and Bruno in their racial guises out on a mission to procure high-end medical care or mortgages, say, rather than trousers and shoes. I want to say I have absolutely no idea how this show was allowed on air, but the more outrageous a show is, the better the ratings seem to be. So here we are. At the end of the day, in terms of like getting views, ratings, and ultimately those things equating to money, the longer you keep something outrageous, even if it's outright wrong, lies, or you know, totally taken out of context, the more money it's gonna produce for those people, while the people involved in that situation are the ones that are gonna ultimately suffer every single time. Race swapping and shoving the N-word into conversation apparently makes for great television. I didn't even know this show existed back in the day. I just, oops, I guess the ratings weren't that good, but I, I don't know. But this isn't the only program that made me drop my triangular jaw at how horrific it was within this realm of social experimentation type videos. Why, why did you guys have to give me a friend option? It was a very turbulent time. We weren't sure what was gonna happen. Now, what you're hearing here is a beautiful reunion between a woman that was given up for adoption when she was young and her biological father explaining what happened, right? No, it's another reality TV program. The woman, TJ, had to pick out her father from a panel of imposters, and if she picks the right one, she gets $100,000. Because I guess dangling a relationship with someone's biological parents over their head is fine as long as they might get some money for it. Something that I just keep thinking of in the back of my head when we're talking about those reality TV show programs is a lot of them, if not all of them, use money as one of the central driving forces to literally force people to be these kind of performing monkeys doing all sorts of weird tasks and humiliating themselves publicly. And I can't help but think that somehow it's related to the fact that kind of our society in general as Americans, we're not really paid fair wages ever. So we really have to go, oh my God, if I humiliate myself on TV for a couple weeks, but I could maybe earn a lot of money, that could be life-changing for me. And it's worth the potential lifetime of humiliation in order to financially stabilize myself. And I think that's kind of fucked up. Maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm totally off kilter here, but I can't help but think that the two are slightly correlated. But I digress, back to this. Deborah Capone, a single mother with an adopted daughter, set up an email campaign against the program and told Today, quote, by turning adoption reunions into a game show, Who's Your Daddy takes an intensely personal and complex situation and transforms it into a voyeuristic display. Adam Pertman, executive director of the Evan B. Donaldson Adoption Institute, agreed that the program was taking a deeply personal and complex situation only to turn it into a money grubbing game show. Am I surprised? No, I'm not. But is it exploitative and messed up? Yes, absolutely. 
One of the show's executive producers said that the idea was inspired by a friend who is adopted. And as the participants and their parents, both biological and adoptive were informed and consented, no one on the program wasn't aware of what was happening, unlike the show Boy Meets Boy that we talked about. Even so, I don't think this is really the best argument when there's money involved. Yeah, the chance of winning tens to hundreds of thousands of dollars is bound to blur or compromise someone's judgment a bit. And even if it doesn't, this tells me that these programs don't really consult experts to see if their social experiments might end up doing more harm than good. Did Black White consult the NAACP to see what they'd make of their race swapping idea? Did Who's Your Daddy contact adoption institutes to see if this portrayal might be questionable? And clearly that one's very rhetorical as they didn't even talk to the Evan B. Donaldson one, but what about others? When you make a social experiment type of reality program, considering the messaging is also very important, as is anything going out to millions of viewers. But old school reality programs seem more concerned about how to fatten their wallets, or as we'll get to now, trim down their contestants. The Swan was another extremely controversial program in which women were given complete surgical makeovers to quote, better their lives. Then at the end of the program, the women had to compete in a beauty pageant to show off their new looks. Basically, it was a more advanced extreme version of what not to wear and you know, those other types of popular makeover shows which honestly, I kind of think those shows were stupid to begin with. Like some of these contestants said that they dress to make themselves happy, not others. And I think that's actually a pretty healthy outlook and something to really keep in mind. Like your happiness matters too. You do realize it's possible to spend a lot of money and still look cheap, right? I don't really care. I, I dress for myself and I like that outfit. I mean, honestly, if you want to wear a literal potato sack and just walk down the street, do your thing, you do you. And you know, if you can do it with confidence, as literally with anything in life, you can pretty much do anything, which I think is really cool. And I, I wish I had so many of these people's confidence. I see so many really cool, like avant-garde outfits that people wear out in public. And I'm like, I am absolutely in love with you and your ability to style like that. And then I'm also like low key jealous because I am such a scared little wet noodle. And I'm just like, I'll just wear all black every day forever until the day I die. But I absolutely admire and love people who are willing to take like a fashion risk and just debut these very cool outfits in public. So honestly, what's wrong with making yourself happy? And if dressing yourself in really cool, fun clothing is one way to do it, like screw the haters. And also who cares if someone wants to dress revealing or not? If they want to change, great. And if they don't, don't force them to. Plus when the hosts are condescending or insulting, they're basically just shaming their guests into changing. Helpful tips are absolutely fine, but why do you have to like shove it down someone's throat? Oh, you don't fit the societal standard, therefore bad. Oh, we're all out here wearing turtlenecks and gauchos or whatever, and you're over here wearing a tank top and a mini skirt, bad. Like, no. But while this program might change wardrobe, The Swan released that same year in 2003, took it one step further. Instead of the show telling guests that their outfits aren't good enough, the message is that their body and face isn't good enough. One contestant, Amy, did have dental procedures, and I understand getting that changed for health reasons, but the rest? Being told that the best way to change your self-esteem is through surgery because nothing else about you is redeemable, essentially? That shouldn't be a first resort by any means. If you wanna get plastic surgery, cosmetic work done, literally anything, that's your decision. And it should be your decision alone to make. It shouldn't be something where you're peer pressured onto a freaking show to do. And it most certainly should not be on a show where you're being pressured to meet some societal standard where let's be honest here, every five to 10 years, the societal standard for what women's bodies should look like is constantly changing. And for the record, bodies are not a fashion trend. Like you can't tell me you have not seen all this drama with like the Kardashians are getting rid of their BBLs. Everyone's getting rid of BBLs. Like, oh my God, the BBL is out. And I'm like, it shouldn't have never been a trend in the first place. If you want a BBL because you wanted that, go off, get you that juicy booty, honey. But if you didn't want it and you did it because money on Instagram or just more attention in your life and you don't feel happy about it afterwards, not to mention all the complications around that surgery, like don't do it. Do it for you and nobody else, but I digress. Now, in the way that this is portrayed, it's like a display and all the value is on these women's looks and nothing else really. And I think it's pretty upsetting when you look at the show. Again, I didn't watch every single episode of the show, but the episodes I did watch solely focused on looks and nothing more. 
Self-esteem and confidence is about far more than if someone has a nice jawline and plump lips or a big booty and a small waist, but that's apparently just the message that a lot of women received was, I will not be confident as a woman in public unless I do XYZ 40 million plastic surgery procedures. Like they're here confessing that they felt worthless, that they were treated poorly and that they've been through a lot. And the resolution the swan gives is just purely cosmetic. It's not even getting to the root problems. And again, and this is just my opinion, the swan is only reinforcing traditional body standards. No, you can't have a stomach. Your breasts are too huge or too small and there's surgeries to fix that. But there's more to it than going under the knife too. The program pushed all of the competitors to their absolute limits. I've prayed for death this week. But they were relentless in their pursuit of goals once unthinkable. I'm gonna be in a string bikini before this is over. These contestants are also working out and despite having to get all these surgeries to lose a massive amount of weight in a short amount of time. And gee willikers, where have I heard that before? Not like this is unhealthy and has been shown not to work in the long run on other reality programs, right? Seriously though, while getting surgery might be right for some folks, I don't think the message of people needing it to be beautiful is a good one. Belinda Bassant, a contestant on The Swan, actually spoke out about this a few years ago in Mel Magazine, telling the world that she had been pressured into the surgeries and quote, edited to look like a catty drama queen on the show itself. According to Belinda, she had almost no input whatsoever into her transformation, her appearance, and she was only given two days notice to appear on the program and leave behind her job, her child, and her house for four months. Thankfully, Belinda's parents lived in the area and were able to help her out. And her boss was remarkably understanding about the whole thing, but Belinda recognizes that many people would not be able to do something like this. Plus the show did give her $500 per week that she was able to send home so that her parents could pay bills and take care of her son. As for the program pushing them to physical and mental limits, it may be worse than you think. Belinda explains that she had a blepharoplasty, her teeth done, a breast reduction, the fat removed from her cheeks, and liposuction all done within a two week time period. That is barely any time to recover and Belinda didn't even want the surgery done on her face. She said that she hadn't been unhappy with her face structure, but the show's pictures were taken to make her look as ugly as possible. And it's not as if the program was about to tell people about the scarring Belinda now has from those unnecessary procedures. As if all the physical and mental effort and difficulties weren't enough, the Swan allegedly created drama when there wasn't any because, you know, ratings. I guess a supportive group of women talking to one another and helping each other through surgeries isn't enough. No, they needed superficial and faked arguments or bickering to make things seem scandalous. It's no wonder this thing has been called a stain on reality TV, sadistic or a horror because it kind of, it honestly is. So what are we left with then after this Wild West reality run is over? Have we learned our lesson and stepped away from harmful transformations or did this leave us worse off than ever? We're gonna take a look and try and answer the question if we're any better off now than we were then right after a quick word from today's sponsors. The economy has become more and more questionable, at least in recent years. We don't really know where everything's going and the future seems a bit gray to put it lightly. So when it comes to saving money as a small business owner, every little bit helps. ShipStation helps you access discounts up to 84% off of USPS and UPS rates and you can manage every order from one simple to use dashboard. ShipStation's dashboard is literally incredibly easy to use. And if you don't believe me, you can use a free trial from me and see how quick the setup is. Like it's actually quite impressive. It's super easy for you to compare rates. So you know how fast something's gonna get there and how much it's gonna cost you between multiple carriers. And it just right there, couple clicks and you move on to the next order and you're done. It is so easy. And trust me, when you've got a million and a half things to do, the last thing you need is something that's gonna throw like 14 more things onto your plate. And this does the opposite. And did you know that over 130,000 companies have grown their e-commerce businesses with ShipStation? And that 98% of those companies that stick with ShipStation for a year become customers for life? Well, believe it because it's literally that easy. And ShipStation is going to effortlessly integrate everywhere you sell online, including Amazon, Etsy, eBay, Shopify, and more. So wherever you are, ShipStation's there too. So worry less about the bottom line when you can save money with ShipStation. Make sure you go to ShipStation.com and use code CASKET today and sign up for your free 60-day trial. Again, that's ShipStation.com, promo code CASKET. 
But hey, maybe you don't own a small business, but you still wanna save some money. I mean, seriously, have you seen the impact of inflation? Have you seen how expensive everything is getting? Because I have, and it's getting a little bit much. That's why whenever I can find a coupon or something to help me with my online shopping, I am so excited for it. And that's why I love using today's sponsor, Honey. Thanks to Honey, manually searching for coupon codes is a thing of the past. Honey is the free shopping tool that scours the internet for promo codes and applies the best one it finds to your cart. And it's super easy. You just do your online shopping as normal, go to checkout, the Honey button drops down, click on it and let it do its thing. If it finds a working coupon, you'll watch prices drop. And Honey doesn't just work on desktop, it works on your iPhone too. Just activate it on Safari on your phone and you can save on the go. And you guys already know, Honey has been my super saver when it comes to pizzas for D&D &D nights, because who doesn't love to save some money while buying some pizza for friends? And by the way, they recently hit the jackpot for me because I got a 40% off coupon thanks to Honey, and I am so grateful we added breadsticks into the order because of it, so thank you, Honey. So if you don't already have Honey, you could just be straight up missing out. And by getting it, you'll be doing yourself a solid and supporting the show. So get PayPal Honey for free at joinhoney.com slash casket. Again, that's joinhoney.com slash casket. Personally, I think reality TV has changed in some aspects, but not in others. I don't really think a show like Black White could air today without massive backlash. And I think the same about like the show Boy Meets Boy. I could be wrong, but I'd like to hope that we're at least a tiny bit more socially aware now than we were 20 years ago, and this may not fly as easily. According to Insider, more recent reality trends have shown that the world is changing, even if it's only one tiny baby step at a time. For example, in the show, The Masked Dancer, Paula Abdul had a title of panelist, not judge. She stated, quote, instead of judging, we're celebrating. We're celebrating everyone having their time on the stage and making it their own. The coolest thing is the contestants are having the time of their lives. No matter who is revealed, they say it's the best experience they've ever had, she added. Reality programs used to be centered on exploiting people at their lowest lows. And though this mindset isn't completely erased, the success of programs like The Great British Bake Off proved that there is a demand for more wholesome content. We don't need to mock people to make a cooking show like Worst Cooks in America. Instead, Chopped, Top Chef, and Nailed It have shown that human empathy is truly the recipe for success. Honestly, I'm pretty hopeful seeing these trends because whether we like it or not, reality TV does change our actual reality. The fame and attention that came from Keeping Up With The Kardashians is a large part of the reason why Kim has the platform she has today. People were first introduced to Donald Trump because of The Apprentice, and reality TV was one of the first forms of media to actually talk about LGBTQ plus rights, abortion, homelessness, racism, and AIDS in the 1990s. That's not to say they did it well, but they did at least kind of open the door to that conversation. Now, reality TV will almost probably always exist in some form. There are internet speed dating shows out there now, so hey, maybe it'll change from reality TV to reality internet programs. But either way, I hope that the exploitation will at least tone down and we continue towards this more wholesome trend. But with all of that being said, that's where we're going to end today's episode of The Corporate Casket. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, make sure that you're liking, following, and subscribing to stay up to date with all the latest episodes. I really appreciate you making it to the end of the episode. I know there's a million and a half things you could be doing out there today, and yet you chose to spend a couple minutes here with me. And I just want to say thank you for that. So with all of that being said, that is the end of the episode, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.